Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sonali. I'm Head Development and Membership at Asia Society. And it's always delightful to have people coming into Hong Kong. Uh, we've had a bit of a action pact last week with the weather as well as other things. We had the G20, which concluded in India. We've got the Belt and Road Summit that's on. And we welcome speakers as they come into Hong Kong because uh, as our mission, you know, stands for navigating a shared future together. And it's conversations like these that contribute to that immensely. So we welcome all of you, particularly we've got C.G. May here. We've got uh, the C.G. from New Zealand, Peter Lund, um, and our members, as well as family and friends who are in the room. So thank you today for coming in and joining us. Um, as I always say, I wouldn't be doing my job if I don't really put in a pitch for membership, because membership is one of the key contributors that makes it possible for us to bring events like this to you to keep doing initiatives like our student internship programs that we have on. So do consider it. We've got forms at the front. You know where to find me. Uh, we'll have our speakers who are a little delayed. They'll be coming in shortly. So we're going to begin with lunch. And then we'll have Scott Kennedy. We'll have um, Jude Blanchett. And we'll have our chairman, Ronnie Chan, moderating the discussion. And we look forward to enjoying that together. So thank you for coming. And we'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. I want to join uh, Sonali, my colleague, to welcome everyone, in particular the Consul General Gregory May from the United States and Peter Lund from uh, New Zealand. Uh, I tell people that Peter is really a great guy, like Greg, but uh, his accent I have a little bit of issue with, but beyond that, he's a fantastic one, individual. Anyway, um, just a little bit of a uh, nothingness, I suppose. Uh, I, I'm, hap I'm happy today because I found two of my long lost cousins. Uh, never met them before, and they suddenly show at my door. One of them is uh, from Indiana University. Uh, uh, right, uh, Kenneth uh, uh, Scott, you're from there. Uh, and, so, and her parents were also both teaching in Indiana. Wow. Indiana State University, not uh, Indiana oh, University. Yes. Anyway, so we're delighted that uh, uh, old family members can uh, get together. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Asia Society, please join, uh, as Sonali suggested. And if you want to join as a President Circle member, you are even more welcome. Um, anybody can join, by the way. And I tell people that we're the cheapest uh, organization in Hong Kong. Uh, it's only, what, 1750 or whatever uh, Hong Kong dollars uh, per year uh, uh, for membership. So uh, please come. Uh, we have a lot of uh, events coming. For those of you who did not see it, uh, we have a, a program uh, on uh, uh, the, 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 the state of uh, the Chinese economy. I'd like to hear that one. Uh, I, I want to know how they're going to get out of that one. Uh, but I want to, in particular, uh, point out to you a program that is called India by the Bay. We do programs for country-specific uh, from time to time. Uh, usually, on they only last uh, a weekend. Uh, we've done it for Thailand and uh, 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 India, no, Thailand, well, India too, of course, uh, and some other country. And uh, the India by the Bay, however, is a unique one. It lasts a whole week. And so for those of you who are members, uh, please come and bring your children. Uh, if you have children, I think it's a wonderful time. Uh, with all kinds of program, uh, I don't know if you have... Uh, 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 this sheet out at by, by the by the door on on your way out. Please pick up one. We have all kinds of lectures and dances and food and uh, all kinds of things. I was just told by Sonali that uh, one of the family members of the Cartier family will be here to talk about jewelry. And for those of you who visited uh, the uh, the M Plus recently or the Palace Museum, sorry, the Hong Kong Palace Museum recently, you saw the Cartier collection there which just absolutely blown me away. I'm very, very happy that my wife, who's sitting here, did not ask me to buy any one of them because I won't be able to afford it. But anyway, we are very, very happy the, to uh, welcome the two gentlemen. Uh, one of them is an old friend of mine, uh, Scott. We've known each other for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, if not more. And then Jude, a new mate friend uh, from CSIS. Uh, I think there are many, many things in America. Uh, I think one of the ones that are considered to be the more uh, nuanced, balanced, uh, objective is CSIS, and uh, Scotland has been working on uh, the economy of China for a long, 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 long time, and Jude also lived there, so we have two experts uh, to tell us what's going on, not just in China, but also in the United States. So with that, I just want to uh, begin with the first question uh, 
to uh, Scott and to Jude. I think Scott is an economist, Jude is more on the political side, so we are really have all bases covered today. Uh, I, you know, I'm not exactly a young man these, uh, anymore, Scott, but uh, I, I have just never seen the world like it is today. It is just amazing. Uh, so complicated and so uh, frustrating. Uh, so, a a and recently I was with um, Henry Kissinger, and I told him, I said, you know, you specialize in international relations. Let me tell you what I think is the biggest international relations issue these days in the world. It's a domestic situation in the United States of America. Because whatever happened in the United States will affect everybody, doesn't matter where you live in the world. Uh, and so we have two gentlemen coming from Washington, D.C. So tell us, Scott, uh, and later Drew, tell us what the heck is going on uh, in that city that most of us don't understand. Uh, we go there for the monuments and the, uh, and the whatever, but uh, the, the, the think tank world is not where most of our friends are very involved in. So, Scott, why don't you lead off by telling us uh, what's happening there? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Scott and Jude. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie, thank you for that very generous uh, introduction and, and for hosting us. Uh, it's uh, a real honor and privilege to be able to uh, speak uh, at the Asia Society and, and particularly to do so uh, with my partner in crime at CSIS, Jude Blanchett. Um, and um, we're here because we're, we're trying to learn about what's happening in Hong Kong uh, in, the, in the midst of so many different changes uh, and what Washington policy ought, ought to be. So maybe we'll come back to, to that. But uh, to, to begin, uh, just a little bit of autobiography and a little bit of context. So I'm actually uh, a native Washingtonian. I was born in D.C. I grew up in D.C. Uh, but my family never worked in the government. Uh, my family members are all, uh, like Ronnie and maybe many of you, business people. So I almost never went into the District of Columbia when I was uh, growing up uh, because uh, they weren't interested in politics or and, and governance that way. They were interested in, in other things. Um, but nevertheless, having been in that community uh, and interested in politics, and then I got interested in China uh, because of, of, of uh, my grandparents. So on, my, uh, my, on my dad's side, uh, my grandmother actually lived in Macau for a little bit in the early 1970s. You have to think about that period in history if you're going to have an American in Macau. Uh, my grandfather on my, my dad's side, uh, my mom's side was an engineer, uh, president of IEEE, visited China in 1985, said study Chinese. Uh, and once you go to China, you get addicted, and on you go. And my goal since 1985 uh, has been to avoid getting a real job. And luckily, I've succeeded in that since. Um, and But uh, I was a professor at Indiana University for 15 years, lived in Bloomington, Indiana, and really loved uh, IU. Uh, and and my two of my kids grew up, were born Hoosiers. They still feel like Hoosiers. Um, and uh, gave me a new perspective on the United States. I would say now, having gone back to Washington at, uh, in early 2015 to work at CSIS, you know, when I got there, the main challenge for on, on China at the point was, how do you integrate China into the international system? Uh, do you use, uh, you know, the WTO, uh, diplomacy, multilateralism at that time? In 2015, everybody remembers uh, the U.S. effort to, to finish negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then finding a way to bring China on board. The, that was in 2015, eons ago, eight years, eons ago, right? Um, now, since then, we've had uh, uh, Trump, the trade war, the pandemic, uh, Biden. We've had um, Xi Jinping. Uh, we've just had a, a lot of things happen, and, and the focus in Washington is not now how do you integrate China into the system and get along and collaborate and create a lot of win-wins, it's how do you deal with the challenges of having an extremely large, powerful country in which we have uh, s some overlapping interests and, and common problems we need to solve, but we also have conflicts of interest that are pretty significant and could potentially actually uh, lead to war. That's the general uh, change. Now since then, in addition to the fact that the topic has changed, uh, the level of attention on China has changed dramatically. And uh, when I started at CSIS, we had three people that did China full-time out of 300. Uh, I think now we have 12 people that do China full-time, but we have 288 other half-time China experts. 
uh, people who work on who don't work on China as their main vocation, but they write and speak about China. The third thing that has happened uh, is that the le access of, of information about China has dropped dramatically because of the pandemic. Right? Access to China was cut off. We were all working from our basements. In addition, uh, the way Chinese politics has gone, they've, it's har harder and harder, even if you could travel to China, to learn what's going on. So we've got more people speaking, ab focused on China, speaking about China, but knowing less uh, than ever before. I would say, despite those negative trends, I am actually impressed by the, how Washington still is functional in a variety of different ways. I would say the Trump administration, uh, that period of policymaking uh, felt a little chaotic and a little bit difficult to engage. Uh, but I think uh, although people talk about the continuity with the Biden administration, we now have sort of no, quote unquote normal governance uh, in which you have real honest, serious debates about big, big challenges uh, and differences of opinion across the bureaucracy, uh, and a National Security Council trying to coordinate that, think tanks trying to plug in, uh, and even Congress. I know that people just just got to scratch their heads about Congress and throw their hands in the air, and, and sometimes we do too. But having interacted with a lot of these uh, members of Congress and staffers, these are people that are facing real difficult choices about trying to figure out what the role of the U.S. should be and how to deal with China. I don't feel like their positions on China are driven by political expediency. What's going to get me elected in the next election? What's the soundbite that's going to get me on the news tonight? I really, in interacting with uh, these members and staffers, I really feel like they are really trying to figure things out. And as one told me uh, a few weeks ago, we're really trying to uh, brainstorm on what options are. And so we've got 500 pieces of legislation we've submitted. We know only a tiny amount will get passed, but nevertheless, uh, w this is, this is w it's all for us to see. And we're trying to manage inside that conversation. I would say one of the things uh, that's reflected by the fact that we're sitting on the stage uh, is that getting into the field matters more than ever. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more of that, but it's been uh, something that is, is really critical for me that I've uh, put a lot of time and effort into. Went back to China uh, last a year ago, exactly from today, and, and went through quarantine, uh, 26 days altogether. Uh, went through, uh, spent a lot of time visiting Chinese universities and think tanks, government officials, companies, et cetera, in multiple cities. I've been back three times, uh, going back again in, in November. And we've been interacting with Chinese to scale this up and uh, we'll be hosting uh, Chinese scholars at CSIS in just a few weeks. So let me stop there to say I understand the frustration with Washington. I feel it every day. But it is a place where people are trying genuinely to grapple with difficult issues. Thank you, Scott. Jun, uh, Scott told me that you're not an academician, and yet you have uh, lived in China, and you have uh, perhaps a little bit different perspective. We're delighted to have... Uh, all kinds of perspectives. So, Jude, give us your take. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to try to pick up a little bit of what Scott said, in part because I think Scott and I spend a lot of our time in Washington, D.C., trying to nuance the discussion and create a more complicated picture of, of what's going on in mainland China, what's going on with issues around the Taiwan Strait. I, I have found in engagements with colleagues and friends in the mainland and some of our discussions here this week that I'm actually surprised that I think we actually need a two-way nuancing of political dynamics operating in, um, in both capitals. I think there is a, um, a narrative which is absolutely in part true about U.S. overreaction, about Trump, um, but I, I feel like it's, it's um, somewhat become um, it's been stripped away of some of the important nuances that I think are going to be really critical for a city like Hong Kong, but, but talking to Peter, you know, s smaller states around the region as they navigate great power competition, you know, really big ears and big eyes to be able to pick up on some of the nuances op that are happening in shaping policymaking in Washington, you know, to echo Scott, because when I'm in D.C., look, there's a lot to be frustrated about, and a member of Congress on any given day is tweeting or saying something ridiculous. But the real action is in the National Security Council. It's in the Department of Commerce. As they're, you know, it, it's, it's in Treasury. 
where you've got professionals really trying to work through a set of very, very difficult challenges. And we might be disappointed with the outcomes of those challenges, but I think we're gonna miss the boat if we don't understand the complexity of the issues they're dealing with, the political forces acting on those, as well as international actors who are quietly pushing the United States to take positions. They don't raise their hand and say, you know, we support what the United States is doing all the time, but quietly are, are supportive of many of these actions, even if they wish the United States just did it with a little bit, a little bit more nuance. I think the second thing is, really need to zoom out the, the time scale here to understand why US-China relations are where they are. You know, I think a lot of, not in this room, which is, you know, which is a very sophisticated audience, but in other rooms, I feel like it, it, people just think this started in 2016 with Trump, or it started with the global financial crisis. But even if we just take 1949 and the founding of the PRC as the demarcation point, you know, the United States and China were, were fighting in a war in 1950. Uh, 1958, the, the so-called Second Taiwan Strait Crisis, we now know through declassified documents that the United States considered a nuclear strike uh, on, on China. If we think back to 1995-96, the, the so-called Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, where there was, you know, uh, China was uh, uh, firing missiles in the close proximity of Taiwan and the United States had to sail an aircraft carrier into the region to try to get China to stop the threats on Taiwan. 2001, the EP3 spy plane incidents where a Chinese pilot collided uh, with a U.S. Uh, reconnaissance plane and the Chinese pilot died and we had this short, thankfully, crisis, global financial crisis. Um, you know, th this has been a very, very complex, difficult relationship and I think it, it that therefore, the one of the narratives I often hear is, well, the United States is, wants to maintain its hegemonic position and in the international order and that's why they're lashing out. Is there some truth to that? Maybe, but th that really, I think, is far too simplistic of an, uh, of an understanding of the dynamics at work here. To be sure, I think policymakers in Washington look at, um, look at the rapid rise of China, but more importantly, their perception that the political system has shifted not to away from that China was gonna democratize. Uh, I don't think that was really where the, the sort of core strategic community was, but that there was gonna be a little bit more of a seamless fold in of a rising ambitious China, including its military, into the, international, into the international order. And folks in this room can certainly disagree with it, and a lot of us spend most of our time disagreeing with it in Washington, but just to, to try to give a more you know, accurate picture, um, I think there are a number of events, some of these are classified, some of these are out in the open, where there were behaviors from Beijing which people thought, whoa, part of this is a you know, very rapid and opaque militarization uh, the, the extent and scale of Chinese investment in its defense capabilities is historic. And when I travel around the region, even as countries like Japan and Korea and Australia, we just saw a meeting between uh, Prime Minister Albanese and, and, and Li Chiang um, and the sidelines of the G20, even as they talk publicly about wanting to find a very productive relationship with China, and I think they do, they also quietly are very, very worried about what China's military is going to do, what it means for territorial disputes that they might have for China. One of the reasons they're worried about Taiwan scenarios is as much because they wonder if there's a conflict over Taiwan, what does it mean for Japan for our territorial disputes over the Senkakus? Again, we can all disagree with that, um, but I think that is a more, uh, that, that's the more challenging discussion and debate um, that, that is being had. Um, final point and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, I think the other thing is the discussions that are happening in Washington right now, especially around the issue of supply chain, uh, industrial policy, the nature of globalization, are in some interesting and unintended ways, almost the identical conversation I hear happening in Beijing. Just a different lingua franca, but the same core challenge of how do I integrate um, but yet protect national security? If you go to, you know, if you go to Canberra, if you go to Tokyo, um, if you go to Seoul, if you go to Berlin, if you go to Brussels, if you go to London, if you go to Ottawa, the same discussion is being had in all these countries, which is how do we integrate into a global economy? How do we, how do we integrate global supply chains, especially around the technology space, but with an acute awareness that there's these rising national security concerns that there's no easy answer to? Um, so really, you know, the, the, I think most of the discussions and debates that, that we have closed doors in Washington um, are wrestling with these challenges. 
Now, the second part of our job is, however, and I don't think this is being broadcast, but is, however, trying to stop some of the lunacy that you see over-exaggerations of what China is capable of. We've now shifted, by the way, from five years ago, the, the narrative was China's on a you know, vertical trajectory to galactic domination. I think as of the last six months, the new narrative is you know, China's about to head off the cliff, but in a sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, the outcome is still what well, we really need to be worried about China. Um, but that, I think, is the challenge for Washington is we, don't, we, don't, we can't keep our attention focused on one thing very long. Domestic politics, I agree with Scott, no, no voter is, is going to make a decision about who to support based on China. At the, at the, I, think that's a, I think that's a bit of an exaggerated narrative. But there are domestic politics and bureaucratic politics are a very, very strong force in, in shaping China policy. And so sometimes, you know, one bureau bureaucracy will, will highlight the threat from an invasion of Taiwan, not because they diagnostically think that's actually going to happen in the next six or seven years, but they understand the power of that as a force magnifier to, to wage through bureaucratic uh, debates and arguments. And again, that's where I think the sort of big ears, big eyes will be really critical. The outcome of U.S. policy makes it sound like there's a unified voice. But I think un, you know, underneath that, there's deep divisions and important debates being had. And that's where Hong Kong, you know, New Zealand, Singapore you know, can, can actually be a part and help shape that debate if they understand that this is a fluid situation. And there's a bunch of unresolved contradictions in Washington, in Brussels, in Tokyo that no one really has good answers to. And so this is the moment, I think, to try to get in and shape those debates because we very much are in a liminal transition from one epoch, which ended in, could be when, when Putin invaded Ukraine, it could, be, it could be COVID, it could be the election of Donald Trump. I'm, I'm not sure where it happened, but we were definitely moving out of one era of globalization and international politics into a new era. And, and the challenging thing for liminal periods is it's, you, you can kind of, you feel like the foundation is fracturing, but it's really hard to peer into the, into the immediate future and understand exactly what the rules of the road are. But again, I think that's why leaning in and trying to help shape the debates in productive ways will be better than just sort of looking aghast at the United States and thinking, my God, they've gone crazy. Thank you, Jude. Uh, Scott, let me turn to economy first. Uh, you're an economist, uh, and you studied the Chinese economy. Uh, it was mentioned about you know uh, some of the challenges uh, that China is facing right now, and surely uh, a lot of challenges uh, o over lunch, you mentioned about the housing market. That's certainly a, a big one, uh, but it's not the only one. Uh, so can you comment a little on, is China, the narrative six months ago was correct, or uh, that they're rising, or is the last six months correct, that they're going to go to hell pretty soon? Uh, and then if you don't mind, uh, Scott, also mention about the, the U.S. economy, because let's face it, whatever happened in the United States economy will affect the rest of the world. And many, most of my colleagues here, friends here, are business people, uh, professional people. So they are <laughs> very interested in the uh, the U.S. economy. I heard that is very strong. And why is it strong? Is it really that strong? Uh, and then also, uh, somebody mentioned Eddie, uh, from the the head of uh, uh, Blackstone in Asia Pacific, mentioned over lunch just now that the inflation is, uh, you know, uh, amazing. Uh, and I told the story that Barbara and I, my wife and I, went to have McDonald's uh, at Orange County, uh, and two of us, each of us, have a uh, uh, sausage egg muffin set, and it cost $19.50 for the two of us. And then a few weeks later, we came back to Hong Kong, so one morning, in my brilliance, I said, hey, Barbara, let's go downstairs and have a McDonald's, and we ate the exact same thing. The size is bigger, and it cost $68 which is $8 something US. So <laughs> inflation is something that is on the mind of many people because Eddie was complaining. And if Eddie is complaining how expensive things are <laughs> in America uh, uh, is, then the, the rest of us should really be very, very worried. So Scott, tell us. Sure. Um, th those are good questions. I don't know if they changed the, the, the signs on the prices just before you walked in or not. <laughs> but um, let's uh, go start first to talk about China and, and then the, the re rest of the economy. Um, so, uh, folks following uh, China, uh, the economy, 
to me, break down uh, into a Clint Eastwood movie. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? I don't know if anybody watched Spaghetti Westerns. Uh, it's 1966 movie. Um, it's a good one. It's, it was very, very, very good. Um, so some people think China's on an inexorable rise. Uh, it's got uh, very smart people, good infrastructure, <laughs> a, a, a practical government, uh, and that can that has always managed to overcome uh, the problems that it faces. Uh, and so that's the good story. You know, and China, if you've gone long on China since 1978, you've probably done okay. Um, I think there's then uh, the bad story, which is the folks, uh, the people that worry about the structural problems, debt, demography, et cetera. Um, and you hear a lot of those, those voices. Then there's the ugly, um, and um, which is that China has all of the opportunities to continue to grow effectively, but it has, it's making policy mistakes. Uh, because out of ideology, out of the way the policymaking process is structured, or et cetera. They're, they're blowing their chance. And so you've seen those that you could follow just about at any time and find people that fit into those camps. There's almost very, there's very few people that fit in the first camp now, the good camp, right? Very, very few. There's a couple. Um, uh, the debate really is between the, the latter two, uh, the structuralists uh, versus the policy mistakes. Um, I understand that China's got real significant challenges of debt uh, as a result of, of housing, as a result of, of many other, other, other mistakes in a financial system that is, that is hugely inefficient. Um, and demography uh, trajectory is obviously not good. It was 2014 when China's working workforce population peaked, and so it's been nine years on a downward uh, trend. Those are very, those are negative signs. Um, and uh, that will, that create some kind of cap on how, what China's growth potential is particularly. But to me, the biggest thing, uh, I'm in the ugly camp, and if you, if you ask most people, they'd look at me and they go, well, of course you're in the ugly camp. Look at you. Just look <laughs> in the mirror. Uh, and I would say You're next to me, so no, you have challenges. No, no. You, you, you shine compared. So uh, in any way, the, uh, the more s seriously, uh, they're making lots of mistakes. Uh, and these mistakes now seem uh, built in. Uh, they're obviously not clearly focused on growth as the primary uh, target above everything else now, the way it used to be. Uh, you've seen uh, an attack on, on the private sector uh, that's sustained. You saw uh, zero COVID policy uh, and at least and uh, exiting, yes, but the way they exited, uh, quite problematic. You see uh, t growing tensions with the United States, with Europe, with others. Uh, and uh, it and that is really based on the, my interviews uh, with private companies and I investors in China, not foreign companies, but, but Chinese who I've known a really long time. The loss of confidence is dropped dramatically. Now, it is possible that that lo loss of confidence is heavily affected by the, the value of their key asset going down, right? Their housing or, or whatever. But, and, and that is partly true. But I think it's, it's not just that. I think it's really about where they think the direction of the country is going and the level of uncertainty across many variables. And so, you know, that, that is worrying and it's, it's different than in, in the past. I still think China has am amazing, amazing potential to grow, not at eight to nine percent. If it got the policy puzzle right domestically and with uh, internationally, it could grow at 5%. Uh, but now it's looking like you were going to get 3% in good years and 1% or negative growth in bad years. Uh, it's just a full spectrum shift of, of significant challenges. Uh, now, for some parts of the world, that would still be a good story. But that means China uh, settles out at Brazil, not Japan. Which Japan, if you thought Japan was the bad outcome for China, that would be the good outcome. That'd be actually the good outcome for most countries. Um, in terms, and so I, I'm really concerned. Now China's always managed to muddle through, so don't bet against them figuring this out. Uh, the doom saying that's, uh, I, I, I think that's a little bit exaggerated, but boy, real, real significant challenges. On the U.S., I would say, uh, there the U.S. has done a very good job of addressing the short-term cyclical problems and giving people a sense of confidence about the long term uh, with a passage of the IRA and the Chips and Science Act and sort of a return to more normal governance. Yet, 
the level of anxiety in the United States, social fragmentation, inequality, uh, that, those are really fundamental challenges. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm worried uh, about that. And of course, as Jude was saying, you've got nationalist conversations occurring in every capital. That usually isn't good for efficiency and growth. And so uh, it, I, you know, at the, for the moment, it looks like we're gonna get past this increase in interest rates and, pri and inflation without a, a major recession. But we've got other problems coming down the line. And as anyone's looked at the weather this summer and this year, and problems around we have uh, with climate change, we're gonna have uh, the, the inbox for governments around the world uh, to avoid economic volatility. They're gonna have to really do a much better job. Can you say a word also about inflation? Are you worried about the inflation in the United States? Over, uh, as a general rule, I, th I think, generally I think um, we've passed the point of, of peak inflation, which was around foodstuffs uh, and around um, uh, gas, oil, uh, but also driven by- But America produces yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we also produce, also hired a lot of people coming out of the pandemic and that generated wage inflation. And I think what you've actually seen is uh, a, a, s a gradual normalization of the job market. The, the uh, number of people employed is still going up, but at a slower pace. And so that push on inflation uh, because of people's pocketbooks being uh, fatter, I think that's, that's slowing down. So I actually think, in cyclically speaking, uh, we're in a good place. Long-term wise, I think the U.S. has some monster problems. It, probably from the perspective of the Biden administration, they think they've got this timing just right. So, but, uh, uh, but long term, the U.S. still has some really significant economic challenges. Can you tell us what are some of those longer term things that we should be watching out for? Well, we've got a governance challenge, right? Uh, we've got a political system in Washington that, is, is, uh, that we're trying to manage and work our way through, but it's also uh, frustrating uh, at times. We have two political parties uh, who uh, are, are more tribal than transactional, uh, and that makes it hard to get a variety of things done. Um, local governments uh, at the state level actually being influenced a lot by the National Republican and Democratic Party, uh, obviously, and so uh, state and local governments that are, are innovators for new types of policy solutions. I'd, give, I'd encourage everyone to look at Jib, Jim and Deb Fallow's book, Our Towns, mm -hmm. and the related PBS series about good local governance in the United States. They're under stress. Obviously, inequality uh, uh, is, is a huge issue, and obviously that's connected as well to issues uh, related to race relations uh, and uh, white nationalist movements and, and other, other types of things which are, which are real uh, stresses. I would say that still under, in general, I'm impressed by the strengths of the United States, our educational system, our think tank system. Uh, uh, Strike that one, financial that's self-interest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I think we have a lot of we have a lot of strengths and and immigration and and actually if you survey folks if you ask Americans what do you think about globalization and trade, seventy plus percent support uh, international trade. They think it's good for the American economy. But um, is that the number one issue they vote on? No. So we're we're really a fractious place right now. And of course you get to see it all out in the open. Uh, for everyone, and so that, that may lead people to be even more pessimistic than they ought to. Of course, next year uh, with our election, that's gonna be a major turning point. So let's watch to see uh, not just how the campaign goes, but what the results are. Well, June, I will come back to you about, maybe you can also comment on the <laughs> election next year. Everybody's worried about that one. But Scott, let me uh, push on two points. Uh, one is immigration. Now, obviously, the Chinese are moving out. Uh, the Indians, I suppose, uh, are being welcome. Uh, that has been America's strength, is really the immigration. Um, uh, we may even have a, I read an article that the next vice president of the United States may again be of in Indian origin, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so, 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 you think the immigration will continue, uh, and where will they come from? You know, actually, um, obviously, this is a, is, is a giant challenge. Uh, it's been uh, placed at the center of our domestic politics, right? Um, and uh, you, you see this uh, with fights between the Republicans and Democrats in, in, in different states. Uh, I, I still think that uh, 
for much of the country, uh, there's a recognition of the critical place of, of immigrants. Um, and even though uh, there's been this uh, increased anxiety that is, and there's a variety of individual cases in the news and the, you know, the, the, the China initiative by the Department of Justice, et cetera, there are still uh, 270,000 Chinese students from China studying at American universities. Now it's down from um, 350, but it's still s significant. Um, and I still, and, and one of the things that the U.S. needs to do is figure out, is do a much better job of reassuring international visitors and immigrants. The American competitiveness, and this is actually a project Jude can uh, talk much more about, depends on immigration, and, and not just from any one country, but from ar around the world. You really can't pick and choose uh, immigrants. You have to be open to all, otherwise few are going to come. But I, to me, I'm actually relatively optimistic that we're going to keep our borders uh, legally open as much as we can. Um, and there's interesting conversations in the United S in Washington about uh, workers and employment in different industries. But actually, this is really Jude's turf because he's been doing some really great work with colleagues at Brookings on this. Great. I want to get to Jude after this. Next question for you, Scott. Don't put down the microphone yet. Uh, you said something that really, really scared the hell out of me. Uh, you said that China is going to be more like Brazil than Japan. And if you think Japan is bad, uh, that would be the best alter, uh, best case. Uh, now, last time I checked, I don't know Brazil that well. I know your son uh, yes. worked there, uh, lived there. Uh, last time I was there, it's really done bad. Yeah. And uh, the economy uh, I I included. Do you think China will really get that bad? Maybe I should I sell I all I my... It, it's <laughs> less um, picking your specific country than a specific kind of outcome. Remember, the uh, income gap in China is really high, right? For a, for a country of its development status of a per capita income of around, was it $10,000 per person on, on average? But you have a, a, a Gini coefficient of somewhere around 0 0.5, which is, the U.S. has that, but at a much higher level of average per capita income. That is really high. And then, of course, we're all familiar with Beijing and coastal China, and even second tier cities, many have, have significant, have fantastic infrastructure, and, and obviously China's high speed rail. But there are places in China in which you have tremendous um, uh, poverty. Uh, Scott Rosell at Stanford University has done some really important work uh, going to th thousands of, of villages, and, you know, and two thirds of Chinese young people are rural Chinese. And two thirds of those two thirds don't have a high school education. Uh, and so China has a very long economic tail. And so the, really the big challenge for economic growth isn't just like what's going to happen in Beijing, et cetera, and, and how to make the four state-owned banks operate. It's how do you have an economic system that gets those young people an education, well, uh, prenatal care for their moms, uh, uh, care when they're very young, uh, uh, glasses, vaccinations, uh, elementary education, on and on. Uh, those are all things that are lacking in, in rural China. Uh, and so my, my worry is, and is that Beijing is focused on producing a lot of shiny things that look beautiful, um, uh, that fly high or send uh, digital uh, t things quickly. But you know, the real source of, of economic growth long term is human capital. Right, and it's it, much more attention needs to be focused on on those uh, people that are in what Scott Rosell calls invisible China, and so to me that's why. And so yes, maybe China will have a lot more shiny things than Brazil, a lot more high speed trains and other things, but it will have a whole range of of problems and challenges that uh, also uh, weaken it domestically and internationally. And so I'm I'm really worried that we're. China is so focused on the leading edge of the economy, it needs to look at the other parts of the economy as, as well. Who is the Stanford professor? Scott Rosell. Oh, so okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Jude, uh, your colleague has been s saying a lot about you, that you're expert in uh, a, a few things that are of interest to us. Can you tell us about um, those projects that, that uh, Scott mentioned? Uh, or anything else you want to tell us? Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I... I, I pretend to be a China expert. I pretend even more to be a human capital um, 
expert, but just to, yeah, just to, I guess, quickly foot stomp what, what Scott said, I think um, in a way both the United States and China, although they're focused on the outputs of innovation, are both actually, um, without understanding it, uh, fighting for human capital and for, and for talent. And um, the United States is now dealing this with the passage of the CHIPS Act. What you're starting to hear from companies like Intel and TSMC is that the biggest challenge they have is finding workers to, to staff the fabs that they're building in Arizona and, and Ohio. Um, I agree, I think Xi Jinping has sort of a, a great power fixation where he wants shiny robots and, um, and semiconductors, but is, is struggling to grapple with the much more technocratic and boring issue of how do you create a talent ecosystem? A and then, you know, as Scott Rosell's work also shows, China's undergoing a pretty pronounced demographic slump. The areas within China's existing population where, the, where that are seeing the highest rates um, the highest birthing rates are these areas that are in are rural areas where the human capital and the education level is is relatively low relative to urban centers. So urban centers where you're seeing less population growth has higher investments in education and health, but areas with higher population growth are the areas that w which will essentially be the workforce of the future um, are the ones where there's a, a, a sort of a, a secular malinvestment in education and health and nutrition. Well, that's it. is that a new problem or is it an old problem? No doubt the cities have really gone up very quickly and by quite a margin. Uh, but the lower part, to my understanding, the rural area, for example, are also rising. Suppose I suppose the, the speed is not as fast as what uh, you see in Beijing, Shanghai. And so as a result, the gap is bigger. Uh, are you suggesting that uh, in the rural area, um, is it a policy issue, or what is it that they are not uh, uh, building the uh, the human resource in infrastructure in the lower um, aspect, lower side of the society? If you look at the last 14 five-year plan that that China put out, it has a section wh where you can where it say basically sets targets for uh, average education levels that that it wants across the country, and it has some pretty conservative goals for uh, expanding the rate of high school education, vocational training. Um, so some of this, I think, is just a, a, this has never been, since the Mao era, where, where building educational and healthcare infrastructure was a focus of, of Beijing, the, you know, everyone knows about the barefoot doctors, but it was more systematic than that. Um, one of the reasons behind the simplification of characters was to increase literacy across China. So this was a focus of the Mao period, but I think with the onset of reform and development, this just dropped off the priority list, or more importantly, China could get easy um, accumulations of human capital just by just by allowing more mobility within the country because you had people moving to cities where automatically you're in a you're in a sort of a, 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 a human capital e ecosystem that is more highly educated access to health services but as is a I think a broader story with China the low-hanging fruit have all been plucked so you still have enormous populations in primarily ur ur rural areas in China's west and south that still have chronic underinvestments in healthcare infrastructure. I mean, as anyone who's traveled around China knows, you, for all the advancements China has made, the healthcare system is still relatively um, uh, sporadic, I guess would be a, a polite way to say it. And I think just on a, a larger point, this is one of the paradoxes of Xi Jinping. You know, he has centered rejuvenation um, at the very core of, of his grand strategy for China. But, but really, if I were, you know, if we were advising him and want to, what a real rejuvenation strategy would be. I think number one would be human capital. So creating the workforce of tomorrow that you need to power industries like robotics and AI. You can have, you, you want to build out a domestic EV industry, but you know, a mechanic for a modern day you know, electric vehicle is a computer scientist. You know, the ability to do work on this. So we're already seeing reports coming out looking at manufacturing, manufacturing labor shortages in, in China um, by, by 2030 that are pretty significant. And, and the second thing which is related to this is, um, if I were advising Xi Jinping, the other focus should be on fiscal and tax system. Because one of the challenges is paying for, uh, paying for the investments into the services like education, like nutrition, um, uh, prenatal care are expensive. And China, if we assume that the slowdown in China is secular, one of the things over the next 10 or 15 years is going to be China facing harder and harder trade-offs between guns and butter, between healthcare and national defense, between technology and prenatal care. You know, 10 years ago, 
China, I think, just felt a wash in capital as, and it didn't need to make any trade-off decisions. Those are going to start to be more acute and it's difficult to see how you're going to address those when you have a, a, a fairly primitive tax system. Um, you know, still heavily reliant on the VAT. Income tax, only about 9% of the population pays into it. Has, has it been no property tax, although that's been, you know, that's been discussed and debated for, for a very long time. So this is more of a, a, a question mark than a period, which is I don't understand in some key way Xi Jinping's priorities because there's all these low-hanging fruit areas he should be fundamentally, they're hard, but, but he should be addressing if he wants to be creating you know, a, a modern superpower by 2049, which is the stated goal in the 19th Party Congress. It's hard to do that without addressing tax, fiscal, and human, and human capital. Why do you think they're not putting in the property tax? For commercial property, which my company owns, uh, we are really heavily taxed. But you, what you are talking about is, I'm sure, the residential side of things. Uh, what is the impediment to it? I mean, those guys are intelligent guys in Beijing. They must know. Uh, th the reason they don't do it, there must be a, 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 a reason. Whether we like it, we don't like it, there must be a reason, right? Uh, what is the reason? Political? Social stability? Which may render it impossible? Is that what it is? Um, so they clearly want to do this. They, they just finished the, the um, National Registry, so they have been trying forever to have a full list of all the properties in China, which they just finished this year. They've also, on a number of occasions, done trial property tax programs. They did one in, in 2020, along with the Common Prosperity Campaign in Zhejiang Province. They rolled out a very tepid, um, uh, very tepid sort of trial property tax program, which then they just let die on the vine. I, I, think, I think substantially there, there are a few reasons. Number one is, um, and this will be a, a bit of, of a banal statement, but it's really hard. And it's hard in ways that other reforms are not hard. Um, when you're addressing the issue of uh, China's real estate sector, you're, and you're thinking about a property tax, you're having to touch a number of very sensitive issues at the same time. So number one is, and anyone here in asset management will know, um, you know, if, if you want asset appreciation in China, you, you put it into real estate. There's not many other vehicles for you to make long-term investments, whereas you know almost any a average citizen in the United States with just you know, uh, and if you go to, to Vanguard, you don't even actually have to have any money. You can start you can start uh, um, an investment account. Um, so I think part of this is Ch China will have to do uh, several things simultaneously. If you're going to be fundamentally restructuring what is really a retirement market you've got to give people a, a compensating mechanism for that. It's one of the reasons I think the asset management industry is one of the sort of bright spots amongst a, a relatively cloudy, cloudy picture. The other is more political, which is um, China has used real estate as a compensation mechanism for broad, broad swaths of the political, the political system starting in the 1990s, where of course, you know, a, a lot of state employees, SOE employees got cheap, you know, real estate, which has not been taxed for the better part of, th of three decades. And they're suddenly gonna start levying a tax. And one of the reasons that you hear from policymakers in Beijing on why they sort of try to get close to the flame but always pull away is because there's an extraordinary amount of vested interest frustration with mucking around with the real estate sector. And again, you know, as we were talking about Susan Shirk last night, uh, my, my mentor, one of her first books on the political logic of economic reform, talked about the necessity of finding compensation mechanisms for losers. So one of the ways that you facilitate reform, understanding that you're going to be bringing a cost onto population A, is by finding a compensating mechanism where you basically pay off the, the, you pay off the delta uh, between the rent they have now that, that you're, going to be, you're going to be taking away. Um, and the final is real estate you know, market is, is depending, you know, 25 to 30 percent of GDP. As they're understanding now, policy interventions that are ill thought out in the real estate market can have profound knock-on effects that affect the entirety of the Chinese economy. And they're sort of cleaning up right now policy interventions in, in 2020, um, as, as well as just some, uh, I, I think, um, e inborn bad political uh, behavior by uh, real estate developers, assumptions that Beijing would always be there to bail you out. You know, there's sort of a reckoning going on in, in the real estate market right now. But that probably, if you're advising Xi Jinping and you're watching the volatility in the real estate market, I doubt anyone saying, I doubt there's anyone saying, you know what, now is a really good time to formulate and implement a broad-based uh, uh, real estate tax 
And the final thought, though, is I, I, I think inevitably, though, um, China's going to have to do this as a broader package of restructuring its fiscal system. Um, I, I commend a report by a, 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 someone who's affiliated with Scott's program, but Logan Wright at Rhodium Group has written a really good recent report on China's fiscal space that I think is a very sobering look at the structural mathematical challenges China's going to face over the next 10 to 15 years. And unfortunately, you know, China has been able to kick the can on a lot of these issues for a very long time, but from demographics um, uh, to some of these sort of structural problems in the fiscal system, there's not much, there's not much road ahead to, to kick the can anymore. And although it's politically costly and risky for China to do it, it'll be more costly and risky if China attempts to undertake these reforms five or six years from now, after another five years of declining growth, and as some of these pressures on the fiscal system mount, so I think at some point Xi Jinping has to stop procrastinating and use his extraordinary political power to start intervening in the political economy and make painful reforms that other leaders like Hu Jintao, like Jiang Zemin were, were unwilling to make. Well, I have to do a little marketing for Asia Society. Everybody that you guys mentioned have spoken here before. Susan Shirk spoke here before, Jim Fowler spoke here before, you mentioned uh, the Rhodium Group, Dan Rosen spoke here before, uh, and I was told by Ken that uh, Nick Lardy is in town. Nick Lardy was the first regular speaker, uh, first speaker of our regular program here 33 years ago. And that was your mentor, right, Scott? Uh, your boss, right, anyway, at Brookings at the time. But anyway, so in, in, in a f last question I have for, uh, for Jude, and then open to the, uh, to the floor. Uh, you mentioned about the CHIP Act. Uh, technology is obviously the place where it is really uh, being fought out uh, between the major nations. Uh, can you comment on the technology competition between the U.S. and China right now? Um, what is the state of play and where do you think that it's going to lead to? I think to? that's probably, I can take my either way, a either way. I don't dinner, but that's probably more of a Scott question. Uh, either one of you, we know. Uh, Jude is being far too humble. He could, he could. He, he knows this stuff, and he could. Let, let me take a little stab and then, and then fix uh, the mistakes I make uh, on this. Um, over the last uh, 40 years, China's gone from a, 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 a low-level economy uh, depending almost having some technology successes, as Evan Feigenbaum showed, in, in a, just a small number of key projects, right, like building nuclear weapons, other parts of its military, uh, big, a few big bridges, et cetera, to now having uh, being ranked around 10th as the leading global innovator if you go by the Global Innovation Index. Um, for a while, China's rise up this index was a, was a result of gaming the system, of just filing lots of patents and just bureaucratically getting the numbers right. But actually, you now have a lot of very innovative of, uh, companies, uh, research institutes, uh, and, and serious contributions across a, a large number of fields, both in basic sciences, applied sciences, and, and, and technologies. And so China has, uh, on this level, separated itself from most other developing countries, even uh, granted Brazil, uh, which, is, which is, is, is lower, and is now competing with those much higher up, uh, South Korea, Japan, the Netherlands, Finland, the US, Germany. Um, and, and so that, that, that is, that is all, all true. Um, but let's, let's remember that China's movement up the innovation ladder has been predicated on two things, a, a domestic focus on, on growth and liberalizing the economy and professionalizing education um, and uh, improving, which is Im critical to improving human capital, and uh, a, rela a peaceful, open, collaborative, cooperative relationship with the rest of the world so that uh, they want to invest uh, in China, they open their universities to Chinese students, do research on the ground in China, and so that uh, for whatever weaknesses a Chinese institution may have in terms of its weaknesses and in innovation, Apple's innovation ecosystem became China's innovation ecosystem. Google's did. Nokia's did, Motorola's, n uh, 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 Pfizer, you name it. Um, both of those things seem to be potentially changing right now as a result of where China is moving in terms of domestic politics and its priorities and the quality of governance. Um, 
and its relationship with the rest of the world. Yes, China has still very strong relationships with Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, ASEAN, many parts of the world, and their surveys show strong support. But with leading a, uh, high tech economies uh, in, in, in North America, in Europe, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, even across this, uh, of course, with Taiwan, great, great strategic tensions and anxieties, and this question about what do we do about interdependence and you know, movements towards uh, de-risking, uh, technology restrictions in a variety of ways. Those things, those, that pincer movement between what's happening in China domestically and internationally, to me, is, is uh, a big challenge for China's ability to continue to be an innovator. It's actually, of course, as we were just talking about immigration and the United States, a challenge for the United States as well. So we're going to have to figure out how to solve some of these ge geostrategic tensions and realign domestic politics in most places to make us pro-growth, pro-human capital, and, and pro-innovation. -inno it's a challenge all of us face. Um, uh, China, as, as, as much as anyone, even with the record uh, that they have accomplished so far. Good. Let add anything before we're under the floor? No? Okay. Your turn. Anyone? Andrew? Andrew Lang? And then Al Reyes? Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much indeed for leading us through these intricate minefields um, in um, uh, U.S.-China uh, relations. Uh, and for the opportunity of meeting you too personally, because I've been following you very closely online. Um, now, it seems that there is a great deal of um, uh, animosity um, and suspicion um, and, 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 of course, bribery between the United States and China these days uh, in uh, almost all theaters. Um, and this, uh, you referred earlier that to the fact that there aren't too many real China experts like yourselves uh, who understand what uh, China is all about. And the same is true, uh, perhaps, uh, for China. Um, it's, it's a great thing that you uh, flag up the fact that we need to be more uh, multi-track kind of interchange between think tanks and all that, uh, which is, of course, very good, which is not uh, really gaining any significant traction, if I may say so, in quantity terms, especially during the past couple of years. Um, but I'd also like to highlight the, uh, um, the significant program uh, of which I myself was a beneficiary right out of Tiananmen Square, as uh, the I'm referring to the International Visitor Program um, uh, financed by the U.S. government and inviting various other uh, experts around the world to visit the United States. And I thought it was a very, very good um, uh, initiative uh, because right out of Tiananmen Square, I got the chance to meet the What's top leaders. What's your point, Andrew? Uh, so I'm what I'm trying to say is that uh, would that be a, a, a could it could be a, a similar uh, kind of program for China, and um, uh, you know to using your levers so as to improve the kind of interpersonal uh, relations and knowledge amongst the peoples. Uh, just briefly, um, I, I mean I think. As, as Xi Jinping said, right? Uh, and that is about uh, students, tourists, uh, families, and others being able to go back and forth. Um, and uh, that, that's how uh, Jude and I be, uh, became interested in learning about China um, and how Chinese have learned about the United States. Actually, and, and so uh, the U.S. has had the Fulbright program. Uh, I was a Fulbrighter in 2008 and 2009 uh, in China, and part of that program, we came down to Hong Kong, I remember, and, and interacted with folks here. And uh, there's uh, initiative underway to try to revive uh, Fulbright uh, more fully. Uh, we had the Peace Corps program uh, in China. It's uh, been suspended. Uh, there's a variety of things that, that can be done. We need to turbocharge uh, this. Uh, when I was in China last fall, um, there were 300 about 300, 350 American students on the ground in China last fall. That's, that's how all. That's how many when I was there as an undergraduate in 1988. So uh, there were the high of 15,000. Uh, the number of students studying Chinese in the United States ha has dropped uh, a as well. So we have to do. My, but my sense is actually China has uh, a quantitative edge 
on the number of people who study our language or study in the United States. But in terms of understanding how the United States works, uh, I still think there's just a humongous deficit in China about really the differences between uh, Congress, different parties, the White House, state and local governments. I'll just say just one last thing that proves this is the case. Is we, I've ho I don't know how many delegations Judas hosted that where he've asked this or they asked me, is delegations come from China and they ask me, you know, who's gonna win the next presidential election? <laughs> and I have to remind them, uh, I know Chinese politics. Uh, I'm a China expert, and I know who's going to be uh, China's leader in 2028 because I just listened to this guy, uh, and you all could tell me too. But I don't. I'm not an America expert. Go ask our America expert friends. Uh, go to uh, a Atlanta, Dallas, uh, Oklahoma City, other parts of the United States. Uh, that's where uh, you need to go to learn about the complexity and nuance of the United States. And, and, and although I'm a, I'm a friendly uh, old friend, uh, you know, f face for folks to ask, uh, there's just so much more uh, better places to go to learn about the United States than, than asking me. I'm happy that Charlie Cook has spoken for us three or four times. Uh, Al, would you r r yield it to the Consul General first? Because a hand was already raised. A very quick please, intervention by please. me. Um, this and is I a fully agree. The, the, the International US. Visitor Leadership Program is excellent and fantastic, and one of your, you're one of the m beneficiaries. It still is going on in China. The problem is, is people in China don't feel comfortable going on an exchange program with the United States. They politically, uh, if you participate in one of our exchange programs, uh, you are viewed with suspicion, unfortunately, uh, in the mainland. So um, again, I think this is the political changes on mainland China. Uh, affecting these programs. Um, we very much want, the U.S. government very much wants to increase the people-to-people -people dimension. It's very important. Uh, the trouble is, operationally, it's become uh, not impossible, but close to impossible because of the political situation in mainland China. So thank you for letting me just no uh, problem. clarify. Uh, We're still doing those. Are the Chinese uh, citizens still welcome in that program today? Absolutely, absolutely. But I, I understand as a, if you're a Chinese academic, if you're in Beijing or Shanghai and your career is going to be in mainland China, uh, it can be a little difficult accepting a State Department invitation uh, to go to the United States. Dec decades ago, it was uh, an honor. If you got on a Fulbright, Correct. Uh, you wanted, that was a huge honor. And right. now, although we uh, stopped the Fulbright in the Trump administration, um, I was experiencing uh, as a diplomat in, in mainland China, Fulbrighters were having a very difficult time. If you were a Fulbright alum, you were viewed by the authorities in mainland China with a great deal of suspicion that you had somehow been tainted or indoctrinated. So um, always willing to say that there's work to be done on the U.S. side, but, but we need mainland China to, to be committed to these things as well. Thank you. Thank you. Al? Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. When you've talked about the um, trade-offs that China's uh, going to have to make. Um, my colleague, uh, Christine Lowe, spoke about uh, the, the um, net zero and Paris commitment targets, Paris agreement targets. Um, and her point was that for the world to succeed, China has to succeed to meet its targets. It's very important. Um, what are the trade-offs, given the situation of the Chinese economy today, do you expect that they'll have to make trade-offs in terms of meeting their um, net zero or in, in, in Paris agreement uh, targets. My second question is, when Biden, uh, President Biden um, took office, he articulated a kind of modus vivendi that he hoped to achieve, which was that there would be cooperation, three lanes, cooperation, competition, and confrontation uh, as necessary. Do you think that we're approaching that kind of modus vivendi, uh, given all the um, diplomacy that's occurred recently? Thank you. Jude? Um, although the word China expert has been used a lot here, um, uh, the, the idea of China expert makes as much sense to me as an as a America expert. So what I'll say is you, you, there, there's people who, f who focus on the environmental space in a way that I don't. So I, um, um, uh, I, I don't have a good answer about that would do justice to your question about sort of specifically what some of the trade-offs are. I don't, Scott, if you're following this closer. I'll come back to that, but why don't we talk okay. about that? Okay. Um, uh, modus vivendi. Um, uh, um, so first of all, you know, agents, leaders have agency, and none of this is inevitable, inexorable. 
um, there's choices that confront both political systems, but also, you know, the other thing is I, I think one of the challenges with framing this as like a new Cold War or great power competition is it denies, this is not just a Washington-Beijing dynamic. This is much more complicated in terms of the number of countries, actors, companies involved in this than, than we saw in, in 1963. You know, there's no TSMC of 1963, um, uh, and even though there was there was sort of battles for for uh, um, you know blocks and alliances, they weren't nearly as complicated and as fluid as they are today because we're not battling over ideology today. We're ba battling over supply chains, interests, military superiority. So there's echoes of the Cold War, but this is a really different uh, this is a really different sort of of, of uh, competition, one that involves a lot more a lot more players. Um, so I'll just put to the side, no, I, I think we're, uh, we still have a lot of choice here. Um, and I think next year is going to be a particularly challenging um, year for us as we navigate, as someone was saying earlier, the sort of the year of elections. Um, but I would say I do think we need to be quite sober and realistic about how bad things are getting. Um, and I think an issue like um, trying to maintain status quo in the Taiwan Strait is probably going to be the most salient risk that we face. But we forget, as we focus on Taiwan, that there's a lot of flashpoints and frictions in other areas in that region south, throughout the South China Sea. Um, um, so I am worried that we're normalizing, in the United States, we're normalizing the talk of a war over Taiwan. Um, it's gone from being a real black swan risk to being something that I think an increasing number of people are seeing as, as likely. And this is where uh, um, the opacity of China's political system, which I understand from a historical and a political cultural point of view is making life very difficult for people like Scott and me who try to nuance. Because for every, and I have written very long things trying to explain in a more you know, nuanced way Beijing's cross-strait strategy, all of that is undone when China th flies missiles over Taiwan in response to Nancy Pelosi's speaker visit. The next day there was 5,000 op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and foreign affairs saying, see, Beijing is preparing for an invasion. And because we have very little insight into decision making on issues like cross-strait relations, you know, we get we get readouts from Wang Huning's, you know, convening a session on cross-strait relations, or every now and again we'll get an official pronouncement from Xi Jinping. You know, the last significant one we got was his letter to compatriots across the Taiwan Strait, written in January of 2019. Other than that, we're sort of measuring font size, and we've got our microscope out looking for, you know, spacing between words. Uh, on, on speeches he gives to try to understand what his intentions are uh, on Taiwan. So I, I think there's, there's a convergence of um, U.S. anxieties, but also regional anxieties about Chinese military behavior in and around the Taiwan Strait, a misinterpretation of what I think Beijing believes is fundamentally a defensive deterrent approach to Taiwan, being interpreted in foreign capitals, but especially the United States, as offensive and as positioning for a blockade or an invasion, and then fuel to the fire is opacity of China's political system. You know, final quick point, we get visitors all the time from Beijing coming in who want to talk cross-strait relations, who want to talk U.S.-China policy. And I will say they get a very open, candid discussion where we'll talk about leadership dynamics, decision-making dynamics, you know, debates and divides within the policy community. Try bringing those questions, try bringing the reverse question up to your interlocutors in Beijing. Crickets, absolute crickets. And that is dangerous. Let me, let me say a little bit about the first question on, on, on climate and, and, and clean tech. And certainly, um, China is um, notable for being uh, the world's largest carbon emitter, but also having the world's largest green economy. Right? At the same time, they've held both distinctions simultaneously for a decade, and probably the next few decades they will hold both distinctions. Uh, and so you have to be very impressed, right? China's numbers on the number of EVs and solar panels and uh, et, et cetera uh, in terms of, of clean energy. But you also have to be that, that China's non-green economy is still extremely large. The dependence on fossil fuels and coal and imported oil and everything is still extremely large. And China is still investing abroad, coal-fired power plants. So that's a challenge. Um, I'm also concerned that on the international front, uh, John Kerry uh, has tried 
to, to get some kind of make progress with his counterpart, Xie Zhenhua, and they have not been able to get uh, an agreement over the line. And then in multilateral fora, uh, China has, has not been as constructive as it could. We've got, we're almost close to consensus on a variety of areas in a few places, and we're, we're coming up, I think it's COP28 coming up, right? Uh, where we're gonna have difficulty, and China's, China could lean forward more. If I wanted one place that where I want the Chinese to lean forward, it, we know that uh, they said they're gonna peak in 2030, and they will go net zero in 2060. I would, I'm, f I'm fine if they want to keep it at 2030, but I would, I, would, I would say, hey, we'll have a, a year or two earlier. But what I would like them to do is announce what that number will be. What will that cap be? I think that, because it matters uh, where, how high that goes for, for overall, that actually will make a difference in terms of global temperature changes. So there's a variety, China is really in a position to make a, a big difference on this, in addition to everything it's already trying to do. Last one. Nicholas, and then this gentleman will take two more, two last. Hi, I'm going to be really parochial and ask about Hong Kong. Um, it's clear the U.S. is far less willing to deal with Hong Kong as a separate thing from China. It also seems like there's less of a presence here for the U.S. to leverage when it comes to dealing with Hong Kong. That being said, there are real differences, as shown by the PCAOB's decision to audit U.S. and Chinese companies here in Hong Kong. Plus, also, Hong Kong itself hasn't quite decided what it wants to be post-everything. But in your view, where do you think the U.S. view of Hong Kong, whether public or behind the scenes, will settle? Where do you think it's going to end up? If that's difficult, just have to think about like, what's, what's Hong Kong's role in our more tense political future. But love to hear about U.S. policy first. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to answer, and, but I'm going to imagine Greg staring at me <laughs> and I'm going to try to answer. <laughs> no, um, so obviously, it, it, um, I think this is, I think th what the interesting and exciting thing about this trip and where we are now is, I, I think that the where we settle is very much in the hands of folks in this room um, to help shape that discussion. I think it's You mean Greg? It's certainly, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, I was going to say a joke. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very much true that there is a, a, a sort of a conventional wisdom of that, uh, you know, after 2019, China has just now become uh, just another mainland city, is, is I would say the conventional view in Washington, D.C. But I wouldn't say that that's a real firm consensus driven by lots of, you know, sort of underlying evidence. I think it's just our, we moved on to something else, um, and that's just the sort of placeholder heuristic for how we're going to, you know, how the policy community will think about Hong Kong. So I think this is actually more of an open door to shape that discussion. I think the very, very difficult needle to thread, though, is as policymakers watch what's happening in China, as they hear slogans like patriots governing Hong Kong, to try to expect that there's going to be the right Goldilocks understanding of, of Hong Kong as a de jure part of, of, of China and, and after, you know, after events of the last few years, um, um, it seems to have become I even more so, but there's still autonomy here and there are still two systems. We don't have a, a, a tape measure back in DC that rigorously measures exactly where you go from two systems to 1.75 to 1.5 to 1.25. So I think this is, and if I may end on this, I think this is where folks in Hong Kong need to sort of up their geopolitical game and up their sort of geopolitical communication strategy because Again, it's absolutely okay to sit here and say that we don't understand, we have no idea what we're talking about, CNN is to blame, uh, fine. But I think now the question is, well, what's the strategy moving forward? And, and I'm just telling you my view is the consensus on Hong Kong is very shallow, and I think that means there's lots of room to shape what, what, what that means. I think part of it will be, the, the back end of your question is, um, helping to articulate what a vision for Hong Kong is that we Americans you know, we need bright letters and big capital letter, you know, letters to be able to, to understand s sophisticated nuance distinctions that you take for granted and you can feel on a tactile level. Those don't communicate well over, you know, thousands of miles. Um, so I would say it, I think it's going to take leaders here I in this city to really step up, hug the cactus of geopolitics and start thinking about what sort of Hong Kong sort of 3.0 is that, that understands how to navigate these geopolitical waters and clearly articulate um, and thread that needle of de jure, de jure PRC, but that doesn't mean it's just another mainland city. You know, 
Um, I first came to Hong Kong in uh, 1991. Uh, and, you know, have not been here as often as I've been to the mainland, but just really appreciate uh, the people, the vibrancy, uh, the vitality uh, of, of, of this uh, very special place. One of the things uh, that uh, has occurred over the last uh, couple decades is a debate going on in Hong Kong about what is Hong Kong? What do we want this place to be? And we saw that conversation acted out in newspapers, in schools, just out here on the streets, uh, in other places. Very uh, turbulent debates about the direction. And although things have quieted down and it looks like one view of what the city's future is gonna be was settled, I think actually it's still not uh, settled. And I think I have great empathy towards that challenge because there's so many different things that are going on at the same time that Hong Kong has to grapple with. Huge changes uh, to the north with the rest of the country, geopolitical changes, uh, changes in technology, immigration, uh, climate, figuring out, you know, a lot of the conversation has been about, well, what did we inherit? What do the rules say the system should be? And that's really just proxy for what do we want in the future? But that is really difficult for people here. And I really have empathy for all different sides trying to figure that out. And, and, and I know in some ways it looks like the U.S. and others from the outside are saying, here's what our view of what we want the city to be like. And, it, and that's the only one that we'll feel comfortable with. But I would, I would just say, at least from the perspective of, of Jude and I and, and folks in Think Tank land, and I actually think even from the U.S. government and others, w w we want Hong Kong and Chinese uh, to decide that for themselves, and we want to uh, observe and watch that conversation and, and empathize, because actually, we're going through the exact same thing. We don't know what America's future should be. We're debating that in a very fractious way. So I think because of those ongoing co uh, discussions and debates, fractious as they are, I think we're having, that is also f making, uh, creating an extra challenge for figuring out what American policy should be, because we're still trying to define so many different things, as, as, as Jude said, we're in an era of multiple transitions simultaneously. Last question. Hi, thanks very much. My name's Alastair, I'm from the Australian Consulate here in Hong Kong. Just wanna ask you about the leadership um, dialogue environment between China and the US. There's been a bunch of US senior leaders go over to China, there hasn't been as much traffic going the other way. Um, Xi Jinping's not turning up to G20. APEC in the US is on the horizon. How are you, how are you reading that space and, and how important is it that that dialogue is or isn't occurring? Thank you. So um, I'm a big believer in, in dialogue um, at the government level, popular level, universities, experts. I think it, it's, it's genuinely important and I'm not surprised that the US-China relationship has become more tense right at the moment when people-to-people uh, -people contacts of all sorts uh, was the least. Uh, it's not the reason why it started, but I can see why. It, it, makes it, more it, it makes it easier to objectify and simplify your opposition, and, and China becomes uh, a country of 1.4 billion people, one, one, one guy uh, sitting in Beijing to represent, and obviously it's much more, and, and the US is not just Trump or, or, or Biden. So that diplomacy matters a lot. Um, does that, and so I, I, we're promoting track two, track 1.5, track 1.0. It's, it's important. Is it gonna fix things? No, but part of it is figuring out where do we agree and where do we disagree and why do we disagree? And I think that communication just is, is super vital. Um, I'm not sure if this period of I enhanced diplomacy is gonna last long, because we have, a, as Jude said, we've got the Taiwan, conf Taiwan election coming up, we've got a variety of tit-for-tat policies we could do, and uh, there needs to be results. Uh, and, I, um, and, and so I'm not sure if they're gonna produce results, uh, uh, substantive results that you can then show back to your domestic audience and say, you know what, this was worth it. Uh, so. It's critical, does it guarantee improvement and stability long-term? I'm, I'm, it's a genuine question mark. 
um, the administration is under a significant amount of political pressure back home as it tries to continue with this sort of small e engagement strategy, which a lot of this is positioning for potential Biden Xi meeting at, at APEC, as you mentioned. Um, so I think um, one of the challenges is if you look at the reaction um, after Secretary Armando was just in Beijing, Beijing acted as if it really wanted to make further engagement difficult. Um, I think the releasing of the Huawei Mate 60, but more importantly, the sort of propaganda campaign around it, basically wagging its finger and saying, your export controls don't work, um, w was taunting the administration in a way that I think was, was counterproductive if the goal is to help make it easier for the United States to continue um, to fight for the political space to engage. Uh, you know, China is not, you know, w one of the, 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 I think, more unhelpful parts of the criticisms has been, well, we're always going to China, but they're not coming to us. I, I think that more shows weakness on the Chinese side, a discomfort with Xi Jinping leaving the castle you know, and sending officials over to the United States. We saw, if you saw the video footage at, at BRICS down in South Africa, the, the video footage of, of Xi Jinping's translator uh, getting stiff-armed by, um, uh, by security guards, and it was clearly a protocol you know, mistake. I think, I think Xi Jinping feels much more comfortable controlling all elements of protocol and media environment. And you know, as long as the administration is happy to send people over to him, he, he'd frankly prefer that. So um, I, 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 I'm not worried on that front that we're, it's a one-way street insofar as we're just going to them, they're not coming to us. That's more of a pathology of their system. I would say, though, that um, this, the reaction to the Ramondo visit has made the political pressure tighter on the administration. I also think now Beijing is leveraging will he, won't he go uh, as a way to try to get some policy concessions that I think is going to be counterproductive. If you didn't want further tightening of the export controls, don't na 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 the Huawei Mate 60 in front of the United States in this sort of pivotal moment um, leading up to APEC. And then final point is, even taking that aside, you know, clearly there's some, there's some oddities of Xi Jinping's behavior, whether that's the, the, no sh the unexpected no-show for a speech at BRICS, which the MFA tried to cover it up as if he was there by having a camera shot at the back of the room, uh, but he, he didn't deliver the speech. The no-show at G20, the defense minister has now not been seen for two weeks. Chin Gong is hopefully somewhere pleasant, but, but we don't know. So I think you start thinking about their calculus on, on APEC. You know, three months ago, I would have said it's 90-10. Now it feels a little bit more like 50-50. Um, and, and more importantly, though, just think back to 2017 when Xi Jinping was out at Davos sort of embracing international fora as, as avenues for them to shape the narrative. And then just think about the past couple months. Are we seeing a fundamental step shift in how Xi Jinping thinks about being a global actor? Comfortable going to the global south, comfortable going to Moscow, um, but no, no longer is interested in going to try to shape the narratives at the sort of d you know developed world forum. That would be to his detriment. That would be, but that would be to all our loss if China is just going to sort of take its ball and go home. So I do hope there's there's just some you know he's dealing with forest fires domestically you know and he'll get his international mojo back. But I I do now look at individual data points that you add them together over the last few months, and it feels like we could be at sort of an inflection moment. Time is up, so we have to end. So I want three last words. Each word is one word, no more than one word, please. I know I'm not supposed to ask this question uh, because I'm supposed to be nuanced, but I'm a simple-minded guy, so I'm not nuanced at all. I'm sorry, think tanks are very nuanced, I'm not. Uh, so one, one word from each one of you, and then I'll give you my last word. Uh, the, wo the, the question is this. One word answer, please. Um, we'll start with Jude. Who will be the next president of the United States? Biden, <laughs> Biden, Trump, or other? Pick one. Biden, Trump, or other? Trump. Trump. Biden. Trump. Biden. Wow. 50-50. Uh, my, my one word is, um, whatever you say, uh, our speakers are very, very self-confident, uh, and that's really a virtue uh, of a lot of people, is they are very, very self-confident, and we thank you for your views on uh, whatever we had discussed, and uh, come back for the next program. For those of you who are not yet members of A Society, please, call, please contact uh, Sonali, and join up as a, a member, okay? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for <laughs> Scott, Jude. Thank you.